glad that everyone is with us here today. Welcome. To those who are with us here in person, we're glad that you're here. For those who are joining online, we appreciate that you are streaming uh, with us as well. I've had another note sitting up here, so I'm trying to make sure I know what it is before I announce it. There's a senior luncheon October 12th at 11.30 a.m. And if you plan on attending, please bring uh, your favorite soup or dessert. Also, once again, we'll be collecting Marine Corps toys for the tots in the following week. So uh, be looking to bring a toy and put it in a box in the foyer. We will have Bible study this week, Wednesday at 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, youth will be meeting t this evening from 5 to 7. Uh, there will be chess club next Saturday. Deacons, there's a deacons meeting October 2nd, which is, I guess, tomorrow. <laughs> so you don't get much notice there. At 3.30 p.m. So 3.30 p.m. deacons meeting. Sewing circle, Thursday, October 12th at 6.30 uh, you can come and join at that meeting. You don't have to have been going before. You can come at any meeting, and if you have any ideas for projects, they'd love to hear them. Veterans, I know this was announced last week. If you or a family member is a veteran, church needs your help. We will need some information from you to get to Miss uh, Bonnie Berg. Uh, her email is in the bulletin. Photograph of you in uniform, and that can be either dress uniform or just a... Uh, Obviously, I'm a civilian, non-dress uniform. <laughs> Fatigues, BDUs, I don't know what they call them. Uh, branch of service you were in and the rank and the years that you served. Um, there is, today, there's actually two interest meetings in the sanctuary five minutes after the service. First is in the bulletin here, their trunk or treat meeting. Um, short meeting immediately after service for anyone who's interested. I believe the goal is to get 20 cars so you get together here in the parking lot to welcome uh, children from the community. Also, walk through Bethlehem. I don't know if you know it or not, but uh, it will be December next week. Uh, it won't, actually, but it's going to feel like that. Um, it's going to feel like that, so we're going ahead and planning now for Christmas uh, celebrations and events and opportunities to serve community. And uh, last thing I wanted to mention, praise and worship. Meg has went over uh, above and beyond and created a praise and worship page. There's a link here, uh, basically waxhallbaptist.org, and then there's ministries, and then you can find praise and worship. And there you can find, or you can listen to the music that is uh, here via video. You can have access to that, as well as other ones planned for the fall season, so you can get familiar with the music that we'll be singing in church. So that is a, a great opportunity there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we get started here this Sunday morning, Father, we come to you this morning, thanking you for the opportunity to be here, praising you for this change in the seasons, Lord, in your wisdom. You have decreed the seasons that we will have, and we get to see through the year different beautiful aspects of your handiwork in nature. And we just praise you for this cooler weather uh, and for the leaves changing, which will be happening before we know it, Lord. We thank you for everyone gathered here. Pray that you would uh, bless each of us through this service and through your word as it is revealed to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship ask you all to stand as you're able as we sing blessed be the name of the Lord
this love Destined to die Pulled out for all mankind God's only son Perfect and spotless one He never sinned But suffered as if he did All authority Every victory Is yours
Well, good morning. Let me thank you for being here today. Trust that you've had a good week. Let me thank you for the prayers for the Godfrey family, for us, just for the church in general. Uh, and I just uh, ask that you would continue to uh, lift those prayers up uh, for Laura and myself, uh, for the church, and, and for the people around you who need those prayers uh, I know that uh, they would appreciate them, we would appreciate them, but it's good to see you this morning in the Lord's house. Trust that you have already felt his presence. I want to thank Meg and the team uh, for leading us in our worship service uh, to get our hearts prepared. Dr. James Dobson rebukes Christians. He says, I think it's a disgrace that half the Christians in America aren't even registered to vote. And of those who are, only half goes to the poll. When we withhold our influence and our participation, we 
yield by default to those who promote immoral and destructive policies. Pretty bold statement, would you not think? But it's a true statement. You see, we're standing on a threshold of what could be the most important time in our history of our country. Each election year is like that. It doesn't really matter if it's this year or the past years. There's always a threshold uh, that uh, is important. People get confused. They don't understand clearly what the platforms of the parties and, and, and how it affects Christians. A lot of people just go along with their neighbors or a lot of people just go along with what the news says or whatever it may be without really investigating what the Lord wants. See, there's a difference in that, folks. What does the Lord say about all of this? Elections are more than just a presidential election. There's 435 seats in the House at stake, many in the Senate, governor seats, state representatives, and local races. You see, election goes all around. It's not just for the national light. It's all around. It is not a vote for a candidate. It is voting for a platform which stands for the Christian worldview, God's view. You see, that's the whole thing. It's God's view. It's, it's not man's view. It's not what we think. It's what God thinks about this. You see, there's a teaching in church today that politics shouldn't be discussed in the pulpit. Maybe that's what you're thinking about this morning. Oh, well, you know, I, that po the politics isn't supposed to be in the pulpit. There's no need for that. You know what? We should just push for Jesus Christ. But there is a need for it. it, it that's not a true teaching. Because we as Christians should be informed of what is going on in the culture today. We should understand the times that we live in. What is going on? What's in the forefront? What does the Word of God say about these things? And we should understand them all and put them together uh, in application with God's Word so that we can make an impact in the culture which we live in. We need to engage what? God, we need to engage the community, and we need to engage the world. But we can't do the last two unless we do the first two. You have to engage God to do the last two. You have to have a deeper relationship with Him and, and see what His Word says about what's going on in our times. We need to know about the governing body of the USA. Who's legislating laws? Whose morality is being legislated? Did you know that somebody's morality is legislated in our government? Somebody's is. Our representatives who, who support Christian views, can I just tell you up front that there are people who are Christians, who are great Christians, who have the heart for God, who are called to go into politics. Do you believe that? Just like you're called to do the vocation that you're doing, vocation that I've done and I'm doing now, just like I've been called to that, these folks are called to go into the political system so that God will have representatives there. And yes, even in Washington today, behind the scenes, I'm not talking about the forefront runners. I'm talking about behind the scenes, there are his remnant, his people who are working for his view. We just don't see it a lot of times. We have a responsibility to vote in the election, to voice our votes, to support those who support a biblical worldview but here's the whole thing. You have to do your homework on the candidates, not the parties. Let me say it again. I'll say it over here. You have to do your, your, your homework on the candidates, not the parties. Okay? Okay? 
unfortunately, we don't do that. But we should, why? Because the government protects every other religion but Christianity. Did you know that? I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what world religion you are. I don't really care if you believe in a God, but just don't mention Jesus Christ. Because now you're being intolerant, bigot, discriminatory, and so on. The laws that are passed most of the time are based on opinions and feelings instead of solid moral laws, which make a strong foundation for the people. We the people, right? Inalienable rights from a creator, solid moral laws that have been turned into feelings and opinions. Not truth. What we see today in politics is a movement which is called a Christless conservatism. A Christless conservatism. That's what's out in the forefront today. What is it? John Root, who I was listening to a podcast with Elisa Childers. She, he was one of the He was one of the guests on her podcast show, describes it this way. It is prioritizing politics over the gospel, leading to an unholy alliance and deviation from biblical values as conservatism without Christ and is built on the sand and idolizes politics over loyalty to Christ. Does that sound familiar this this day and age, folks? Does that sound familiar that, you know what, yeah, we're of this particular whatever, we're at party, whatever it is. We don't care about the biblical values. We care about values, but it's all about politics and the people that's in it. He goes on to say, some Christians prioritize American politics over their faith viewing America as a savior, and pastors are becoming more political than biblical, and doing this leads to a risk of moral illiteracy. So you know what? There is a place in the pulpit to talk about this, just like we're doing right now. But you see, I'm coming from an angle of what does God view on this? Not what man views, not what Washington views, not what someone else or this particular party views. What does God say about this? Well, God has a lot to say about this. Should we have a voice in what's happening in our world? Absolutely. I hope you agree with that. The Bible teaches us how we're supposed to live and react to the governing bodies that we that choose to protect us. Okay? So look 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 in Romans 13. We've been in Romans since January, I think. We may be in there past December and maybe even into the new year, we'll see. But Paul is starting to make application out of chapter 12 and now we're in 13 from the from the previous 11 chapters. And it's how you apply everything that he's talked about from chapter 1 to chapter 11 into our lives. And that's where we fail a lot of times, right? We fail to make application of the word into our lives, into an everyday thing. We read it, we, th- we, 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 we say, yeah, that's great, and then what? When a situation comes up, we don't pull from it. That's our biggest problems as Christians. So in chapter 13, Paul's writing to the Romans, and he's writing and asking this question. How shall we live? How in the world shall we live in this world today? It's a very pertinent question of today. Rome was under a dictatorship rule, right? You all know history. Nero was in power. He was blaming and he was oppressing the new Christians 
that had just started following Jesus, he would capture him and he would put him in the Colosseum, wrap them up in animal furs, and what? Let the lions, the tigers, and the bears, and everything else come in and kill them. All for entertainment. He would use them as human torches at his parties. He would put them on a cross, put pitch on them, and when it got dark, he would have his people light them up so that they would have light in the courtyard or wherever they were having those little parties. He would use the Christians to do that. Roman society at this time in history was wicked and evil. Homosexuality flourished. Abortion flourished. Sorcery and black magic were prevalent. The masses worshipped the Caesar. No government in America has ever been as pagan as the government in Rome at this time. However, we can see some similarities in today's time with Roman time, right? You can see those similarities. So let's see what God has about this subject of government. We know the background. We know where where people are. Now let's see what God's Word says in in chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Paul goes and says, Every person is to be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God and an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For because of this, also pay your taxes for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to the very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honors. So the first thing we need to look at is this and answer this question. What is our responsibility to the government as Christians? What is it? We need to understand, first of all, Christians, that we have dual citizenship. We need to understand this. We have dual citizenship. What does that mean? Well, first of all, we're citizens of heaven. We are in the world, but not of the world. We lose sight of that many, many times. We're citizens of the kingdom. We're citizens of God, first and foremost. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom is what? It's made up of people. It's God's kingdom. He's the king. He is right. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven. We're here for a time, right? What, at the best 70, 80, maybe 90 years. But our eternal home, if we're Christians, are in heaven and on the new earth, in the kingdom of God. Our first alliance is, Our allegiance is to God. Did you hear me? Our first allegiance is to God. Secondly, it's to the United States and the government of the United States. Did you hear me? Our allegiance is to God and His ways. Secondly, then, it's to the United States and to the government. See, we get those mixed up, right? Y'all can do this. We get those mixed up. We think America is going to be the Savior, and all these people up in Washington is our Savior, and they're going to make it better. 
How long have we been in government? 200 years plus. Has it gotten any better? No. You see, we're looking for and learning how we should live according to God's standard in, the, in this world, focusing on what God wants us to do for his purpose that he has called us to do. And he called every Christian to engage in this culture, however that may look at. Every one of you should be engaged into the culture, should be talking to people about Jesus Christ, about talking about where our citizenship is, what is important. What's important here? How do we do that? To make an impact and to help grow the kingdom. However, what happens? We live in two worlds which collide with each other, right? We know what we should do and ought to do, but we don't do it. We get caught up in the things of the world. And they contradict each other. We're citizens of the United States. We're under the guidance of the U.S. government no matter how. How well you want to come up and cheer that or if you want to boo it. It doesn't matter. We're under that guidance. Now, don't get me wrong, y'all. You say, man, Chris, you're all over it. You're all over America. You're down. No, I'm proud to be a U.S. citizen. I'm proud to be in the United States. I'm proud that we have the things that are available to us. That we can do the freedom to come in and worship. The freedom to go out and do the things that we do. I'm proud of that. Don't get me wrong. And I think the Lord wants us to be that way. But our first allegiance is to Him. The role of the U.S. government is to restrain evil and to protect. We have an obligation to live under that authority and to obey its laws look look in 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 verse one and two every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from god and those which exist are established by man is that what it says no it, it says by god government was established by God. Man has not instituted government god instituted it he ordained it after the flood If you'll go back and read about the flood, you'll see that God ordained it and and pushed it from that time on even to now. He put order in it. And there's no authority of government but from God. Whether you think there is or not, God has that authority. He's the one that gave it to us. He set the standard. He gave the order of government, not man, even though man thinks he did, right? Man thinks that he's in charge. Would you agree with that? Would you think those up in Washington think that they're in charge, that they're entitled to be where they're at and to do the things that they are? I don't care what party they are. Because why? My allegiance is to the Lord, (laughs) not to a party. But what about evil people and groups, you say? How about Hussein? How about Hitler? You know what? Are, do, do we submit to them too? How about Al-Qaeda or Stalin? Do we submit to them too? God tells us that Satan is active in this world and in, in politics. Did you know that? In Luke chapter 4. In the temptations of Jesus, it says, And he, Satan, said to him, Jesus, To you I will grant this whole realm and the glory that goes along with it, for it has been relinquished to me, and I can give it to anyone I wish. So then if you will worship me, all of this will be yours. You see, Satan is control of that whole realm. We can see it. If you look at it and you follow the politics of the country and and things that are going on, you can see that Satan is in control of that. That that how does he do that? Through people. Success, power, right? Position. 
That's how he does. He, he finds the person's weakness and then they go all aboard and they want all the power. They want all the approval. They'll do anything for it, right? That's why this country's in the mess that it's in. That's why the hot topics that are in, in front in the news are where they're at. Is because it's not that people necessarily approve of it. It's because they want the vote, they want the power, and they want the money that goes along with it. See, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, Jesus says, and he causes chaos, and he's doing a great job of it. He uses people who aren't aware of how he works and uses them in his plan. See, he's got a plan just as God's got a plan. His plan won't overcome God's plan, but he's got a plan. The scriptures say that God's in control. Proverbs 21.1 says the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Biblical examples. Cyrus in the book of Daniel allowed the Jews to go home. How about Saul, King Saul, as he wove his way through being the king of Israel? You see, God can turn evil into good. We know that. But here's what we need to understand ultimately. Jesus Christ will reign over the entire universe with the government upon his shoulders, Isaiah says, right? And he will reign justly for all eternity. We won't have to worry about this in the days to come. We won't have to worry about all this chaos. Everything's going to, because when Jesus comes back and he sets up the kingdom, all of that mess will be gone. Every one of them. We'll have to worry about it. We'll live the way that we're supposed to live. Every person, it says in verse 1, every person must be in subjection to the government. That means every soul. Every soul. Not just some, not just the others, not just this group or that group, but every soul must be in subjection. Subjection means to place oneself under the authority of another. So as Christians, we're, su we're to be subject or we're supposed to subject ourselves to Christ's government. And as Christians, we are supposed to subject ourselves to what? The U.S. government. You know what? If you look in the political realm today and you turn on the news, there's a lot of people, a lot of Christians who don't subject themselves to the U.S. government. You can see it. You can see it on social media. You can see it everywhere else. We don't like that. George Washington said, It's the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection in favor of government. What benefits were provided by God in establishing the governments? Look in verse 3 and 4. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. So what is it? The government is a sword. Verse 4. The government is a sword. What does that mean? It means that it carries out or it's supposed to carry out punishment for those that go against the established laws, right? What does that mean, it's a sword? It means that we look at it in the capital punishment end of it. The government's supposed to carry out capital punishment. Why is that? It's for the protection of the people. Government is, uh, you know, good for that. But it should be carrying out the death penalty because it proves the value of human life. In fact... Why would they do that? Because everybody's made in God's image. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds human blood, by other humans must his blood be shed, for in God's image God has made humankind. God addressed the issue. 
right? Man has lightened that issue up just like he has with marriage and everything else. God's addressed the issue. You kill someone, you're supposed to be what? Punished and, and, and your life should be taken. To show what? To show other folks that, you know what, the government is here to protect the good people, the ones that aren't doing that. Government is to be feared to those who practice evil. That's their role. Government role is to carry out what has been instituted for them to do. Secondly, the government is the sort of order. It's the, we have that constitution. We, we're privileged to have this constitution of the United States of America. And, and, and government should be swore to protect that. That's what the foundations of our country was laid upon. The government is the sword of war. The defense of the nation, the defense of state. You know what? We do go to war sometimes. Why? To protect the people of the United States. You see, it shows authority and it also instills fear when the government does these things. It's needed more today than ever. People don't see it that way sometimes. But you know what? We need it to thwart evil, don't we? So what's our responsibility to government and politics? What's our responsibility for that? Well, in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, it says this. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of him. The purpose for the prayers of our political powers and people is this, that we may live a peaceful life. That's why we need to pray for our government. That's why we pray Democrat, Republican, Independent, whoever it is, we pray for them. Why? So that we can have a peaceful and tranquil life. That's a little bit different than what you see today, isn't it? it it's all chaos today. I wonder how many Christians actually pray for their representatives in a good way. Not like, oh, I wish you'd just take him out of this world and kill him or whatever it is. How many of you would pray for that same person and say, Lord, we want you to bring them to an understanding of you. We want to see their soul in heaven if they haven't already made that decision. See, it's a whole different attitude than what you see on social media and the television today. If we would pray for our leaders and come humbly before God, and ask him to give them the knowledge and the wisdom to lead. You see, they're ministers of God in Romans 13, 4. That word ministers means servants. It's the same word that is used for deacons. They're servants of the people. They're servants of God, whether they know that or not, because he established it and he ordained it. They're part of God's team. We should pray that they would be a part of God's team and a good, have a good sense of justice. And, 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 and we should ask God to make them great candidates. You see, how different is that than the attitudes that we have today? That's always negative about no, what's going on in this country and the leaders of this country. It's a whole different attitude. Let me ask you this question, and I did. Have you prayed for the leaders or for leaders to come to the Lord? God hears his people's cry, and he'll do something about it, Exodus 2, 23 says. But you know what? We have to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves and not get caught up in all this rat race and everything else. We've got to remember who our allegiance to is first of all, and that's to the Lord. And when we do that, then we can start praying the way that the Lord and the Holy Spirit leads us. And you know what? Believe it or not, Christian, we can make an impact in this culture that we live in. Believe it or not. If you don't believe me, read the book of Acts. 
Because the book of Acts is all about how the Christians changed the culture at that time. And people say, we can't change the culture. Yes, we can. If we understand our responsibilities, if we understand what we believe and why we believe it, and we can tell others and we start coming together. Secondly, we preach to our leaders. Ephesians 4, 14, and 15, and I'll just paraphrase it. You can write it in your notes if you're taking notes. It says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, and that's Christ. You know what? When our leaders come, when our leaders are before us, when we sit down and email, we need to speak truth to them, not falsehoods, not opinions, not feelings. We need to speak truth to them, whether it's popular or not, and say, hey, this is wrong. You don't need to be doing this. There's nothing based on what you're trying to do that, that even is reasonable or logical in this, whatever it may be. We write them, we email them, we call them. We're not to be silent, folks. You know what? I've heard from the pulpit, hey, Christians, you're supposed to be silent. We just pray. We just do this. No, we're not. Christians have come to the trumpet's call time and time again throughout history. On all issues, the homosexuality front, on the abortion front, on the human trafficking front, on the marriage front. We're supposed to be in all of that. We're supposed to be carrying on conversations. We're supposed to engage people in all of that to tell them what the truth is. Because if we don't tell them what the truth is, what happens? Somebody else is going to tell them the falsehood of it. And it affects all of our families, I can tell you that. Everyone in here... In some way, shape, or form, those things have affected. Either through friendships, family members, whatever it may be. Here's the key, though. We don't do it violently. We don't do it violently. But we dare not be silent. We work peacefully. We work legally. We vote we line up with Christian worldviews. We look at the traditional marriage, the sanctity of life, the freedom of religion. But you say, Chris, when is it okay to disobey government? It's when they are oppressive. You see, no government can oppress us to disobey God. And here's where we failed, folks. Here's where we failed. Acts 4.19 I think it's uh, John and Peter before the Sanhedrin says, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey man rather than God. He said, nope, we're obeying God. No matter what the cost, you can do whatever you want to with us, but we're going to obey God and his word, not man and his tradition or his opinions. Government should be obeyed as long as it takes its place under God and doesn't take his place. Just remember, we have to accept the consequences of our own actions for God. And we see it throughout the Bible. We see it throughout history that those who would not bend to man's power, it cost them their lives. We see it. And sometimes it will cost us our lives. Isaiah 59, 14, 15 says, Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the streets. Oh, my goodness. Isn't this a great passage for today? And uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself pray. So you know what? Pray, P-R-E-Y, not A-Y, Okay. That means that if you stand for truth, you're going to get mocked. You're going to get spit on. It could cost you your life. It could cost you your job. It could cost you your finances. It can cost you everything. But that's why Jesus says in Matthew 10, you should count the cost before you come and follow me. Thirdly, we pay to our government, six and seven, right? 
For because of this you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God, devoting themselves to the very thing, render to all what is due to them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom due, fear to whom and honor to whom. We pay our taxes. We render to Caesar what Caesar's and to God what is God. Christian, we pay our income taxes. And we don't complain about it. Why? Because we're supposed to honor the government that has been put in place before God. Okay? We pay our income taxes. We pay our custom taxes. Whatever tax it may, just pay it. Be the example. You're, we're, we're supposed to be the example in this. We're supposed to be obedient uh, and, and, and be examples of Christ. Just do it. We're obligated to do it. What did Jesus say to Peter when... when, when, when uh, what are the officials, tax officials or, or the Pharisees said, hey, you know what, have you all paid your taxes? And what did Jesus say? He said, hey, Peter, go down, catch fish, take that denarius out of his mouth and pay our taxes. Remember that? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be paying our taxes. We're supposed to be examples of living for Jesus Christ. Then fourth, we participate in our government. We participate in our government. That's verse 3 of Romans 13. We need rulers who are good, who stand for justice. We need people that have biblical view on things, that, that understand how the world's going and how they can make an impact. So, you know what? I never discourage anybody that wants to go into politics. Especially good Christian folks who know that's where they need to be. The Lord's leading them that way. I never discourage that. Because you know what? They may be the ones that make a difference. And we need to pray for them. And they need to participate in that. Daniel Webster says, whatever makes a man good, a good Christian makes him a good citizen. We see good Christian people in government throughout the Bible, don't we? Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king. Daniel, advisor and counselor to the kings. All government workers, right? Never look at it that way, but they are. And you see what God has done through their ministries can happen even today. So what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do on election day? A month and so many days from now. What is it, a month and six days from now? We obey God and government. We continue to contend for the faith. We continue to spread the gospel. And yes, folks, we do need to get ready in all of that. As we go vote and we voice our, uh, uh, our truths and everything, we need to get ready for persecution because Jesus says you know what if they persecute me they're going to persecute us so let me end with this Tony Evans wrote a tiny little book called how should Christians vote there's one chapter entitled is God a Democrat or a Republican and what he says in this is probably different than anyone could ever imagine it's very insightful the scripture clearly states the role of the believer in the midst of society. And, and then he quotes a famous authority on the role or our role in society individually and what it should be. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. You are the city set on the hill, a city that can't be hidden. Nor does anyone take a light or a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all those who are in the house. So let your light shine so, uh, before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The authority he, he got quoted is out of Matthew 5, and that, that, that authority is Jesus. Jesus said that. 
Evans goes on and says, Our job as Christians is to infiltrate where the bacteria of unrighteousness and darkness have permeated and made themselves at home. It is our job to act as salt and light in both parties and offer the kingdom's point of view. One way you do that is in your constitutional republic, or within a constitutional republic, is through your vote. It's a great challenge. That's the way it ought to be, whether we want to or not. So here it is. What, what's our responsibility? We need to understand the who, how, what, and why that government was, stand, uh, was set up. It's our responsibility to understand we have dual citizenship to God and to country. It's our responsibility to understand our role in government. Here's, here, here's the invitation. I'm going to invite you all, if you want to, would like to come up and pray for all of our officials. Washington, North Carolina, nation, local people, whoever it is. You come and you pray. You pray that God would open their hearts up. You pray that God would send good people so that we can live a life of peace and tranquility. You pray for the church that she will stand up and be strong and courageous in this fight. Ask God to give you an understanding of government and what our role is because we can engage God and the community and the world as we move forward. To reach Christ, whatever God is, as I as the praise team comes, uh, or as Meg and the praise team comes, you you do whatever you need to do at this time of invitation. Please stand, and we'll sing this song just once through as you're coming forward to pray. If you desire to come forward and pray, and then Joyce, if you just play softly while people are praying for our nation and our government.
Thank you all. Um, I know that it, the message was a little bit different today. I know that it was maybe in a little bit more challenging than what you might have thought about in here. But you know what? I just want to make sure that uh, you all understand and we get back to the foundation and the truth of who we serve and who is our Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. And he has it all figured out, and he's already won the battle. So I hope that you'll take this one out with you uh, in this week, that maybe it'll open up a conversation with somebody and say, whoop, you know what, let's just go back a little bit, and let's talk about this a little bit, and point them in the direction of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Bob, if you'll come up here with us. This is Bob Tetlow. Bob um, is coming to seek membership into the church. I've talked with Bob on several different occasions, um, he is uh, asking transfer a letter from First Baptist Indian Trail. Uh, Bob knows all of our uh, requirements, baptism, trust in the Lord, prayers and tithing. Uh, so what's the favor of the church? We got a motion? We got a second? Second? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Bob, I want to be the first to welcome you to be able to come and be a part of here. Bob's got a lot of gifts and talents. Uh, you'll start seeing him use this Wednesday night, okay? Because he's going to lead the Wednesday afternoon and the Wednesday night study. So uh, be sure and come. He, he, he's, he's got some great teaching that he wants to share with you, but he has been thinking about joining for quite a while now from what I understood. <laughs> so uh, he just now, today's the day that he chose to do it. So Orderly fashion, once again, everybody come this way and everybody go out that way, okay? God is a God of order, not chaos, right? <laughs> Trust that you'll have a great rest of the week. Trust that you'll take the message with you and always, always, always look at the cross, look at Jesus, look at the resurrection and know you're worth something, you're a value, and we've got victory. Thank you and God bless.